Greetings shippers, welcome back, and it's time for another episode of Fanversations, the series where I chat about a variety of things with you guys, the fans. Today, we're joined by Morgan, and we have a lot to chat about. We talk about shoujo versus shonen, accessibility of those types of anime and manga. We talk about stereotypes and defying them, and oh, so much more. It's a fascinating discussion, so I hope you stick around. So if you're so inclined, be sure to check out her YouTube channel, especially if you love ukuleles and book stuff. I will of course have all pertinent links down below. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please do follow on social media to stay up to date, know when we're streaming, and just come on over and chit chat about fandom. It's a good time, I swear. I absolutely adore chatting with you guys. And well, it's a long one as always, so let's get started. Greetings shippers, it's Sasha here with... I'm Morgan, hello. <laughs> so, I have to ask you, of course, how did you get into fandom? So, I, uh, I had some very interesting happenstance in childhood. I've always been in fandom because my mom was like OG Harry Potter. Mm. And my stepdad was like just all over video games and everything. So I've always just kind of had that in life. But when I was, what did I say, like nine, which is way too young, but... Um, I started reading this series called The Selection Series by Kira Cass, which is basically Hunger Games meets The Bachelor. <laughs> and that was kind of, so from there I just, you know, started following all the Tumblrs and all the Instagrams and just got into it from there. And you emailed me about specifically some of the appeals in the Western world of shoujo versus shonen. So which one do you prefer? I prefer shoujo because... There's so much power in that that I don't think a lot of people see in mm. some ways. Shoujo is female. I mean, there it's female power. And a lot of people, like, when you look at, like, oh, these are the most popular, most suggested animes. It's Death Note. It's Attack on Titan. It's, it's mostly shounen. It's mostly geared towards guys. Mm-hmm. Um... But it's kind of interesting to look at shoujo from a critical perspective because there's a lot of female empowerment there. I mean, some people look at Sailor Moon and see, oh, it's girls in short Philly dresses. This isn't anything. But it's girls who are allowed to be feminine fighting things in the same way that men do while still having their femininity and their lives. Mm-hmm which is not something that we see in Western culture a ton. And it's interesting because when people do think of anime, they do tend to think of the shonens first, but that may also be because that tends to be a lot of what is imported and shown. It was definitely the case for me growing up that definitely there were way more Dragon Ball Z's, Digimon's, Yu-Gi-Oh's than the alternative, like Sailor Moons and Card Capture Sakura's. And those things. There just weren't as many. In fact, I don't think people are aware how many shoujo style anime are out there because they just don't seem to be imported to quite the same extent as the shonen. Oh yeah, unless you like have a gateway into it and start exploring, it's hard to find it. And part of that is kind of, at least to my opinion, based on the fact that in Western culture, you see women, like if you want to see a strong woman, she's normally masculine mm. a lot of times especially in the early 2000s when anime was starting to be like a big deal 90s early 2000s um femininity was kind of a bad thing and still is seen as a bad thing so a lot of you know having so many shows that focus on femininity as not a negative thing i think makes um makes it hard for a lot of those to be imported so why do you think, like, why do you have that feeling that um, femininity is viewed as a negative in certain, like, medias? It's it's a continuing thing that's seen, I mean, throughout stuff. Strong women are women who are seen as masculine. You have, you know, your strong, you know, strong female characters like Katniss and characters like that who aren't very feminine. They're you know, they act fairly masculinely, they're the breadwinners, they're this, that, and the other. Um, and also, you get the dichotomy where, like, girls can dress masculinely but, and be fine and be seen as sometimes even stronger if they're dressed, you know, in pants or whatever. Guys can't dress femininely. It's a very, it's a very distinct thing, and I see it a lot in media because we're not showing 
it's it's become more prevalent to actually move away from that but we don't show girls strong feminine girls so you feel that the um the more traditional female gender roles are kind of being excluded and looked down upon a bit yeah definitely Mm. definitely i think that is interesting and i think it does feed into why we import so much shonen at times because there is this kind of feeling that shonen is for everybody even though in its base definition it's not it's meant to appeal specifically to a young male demographic but there is this idea over here that like shonen is for everybody but that shoujo is for girls which then creates that dichotomy because instead of both being able to be for anybody to enjoy, because of course people can enjoy both, there's definitely stuff to enjoy for everybody in both, there is very much an idea that it's okay for girls and boys to like shonen, but less okay for a boy to like shoujo, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's boy stuff is for everyone, girl stuff is for girls. Yeah. I think it's a good point to bring up that there are many ways to be empowered and female and just empowerment in general. And that empowerment doesn't have to necessarily deal with tropes that are typically applied to masculinity. Because as gender roles change and shift, of course, you're going to see all kinds of movement across and exceptions for everything. But that doesn't mean there's anything necessarily wrong with traditional gender roles or people who enjoy enacting them. There's nothing wrong with, you know, being feminine, enjoying typically feminine things, clothes, makeup, up, all of that stuff but they do tend to a lot of times be treated as weaknesses or character detriments rather than character strengths and it's and it's it's just this long prevalent thing and i think that that that's why we don't see very many shown or shoujo in the mass market because so many shoujo are based on pink and frilly dresses like girls doing cool things in frilly dresses um and that's not a thing that we see as a good thing that often. Why do you think that is? I think it's because we see, you know, the frilly dresses is kind of a, like a callback to like the 50s when women were expected to be in the kitchen. <laughs> doing stuff and, you know, taking care of the kids. But it's not like that at all. Like... I'm wearing a frilly dress right now. <laughs> it's covered in Sailor Moon stuff, but it's a frilly dress. And I'm not in the kitchen. I'm sitting in front of a giant bookshelf. You know, what what you wear and what colors you like and what you're seen in and how you present yourself is not what you do. And we have this weird stigma in our society where we don't understand the difference. A lot of people don't understand the difference between gender presentation and gender identity. You know, we don't understand that, like... To be feminine doesn't necessarily mean that you're like a like a fifties lady. You're not, you know, you don't identify as a housewife, even if you dress in silly dresses. And the thing is that that also kind of denies the strength of the housewife and that choice, because the entirety of what feminism is meant to be is the choice and the ability to make it. And so the fact that you should be presented with all of the choices and not belittled for some of the others. I think that it, it, it's hard for people to understand, like, that girls in, you know, pink Philly dresses fighting bad guys isn't necessarily just a feminine show and isn't, isn't something that can only appeal to girls. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there are so many shoujo that nobody know about, knows about. Yeah, sh share some. Share some for the people who don't know about the shoujo. <laughs> so I have um, above me, these are my manga shelves. Mm. Yes, and then, um, yeah. Uh, so I have tons of suggestions, including I love Madoka Magica. Mm. It's very similar to Sailor Moon, but it's, in, it's kind of creepier, and it dissects the magical girl in a really interesting way. Mm-hmm. Maid Sama is the most amazing fluffy manga or an anime ever. It's this girl who's like the strong, rough and tough, you know, school president who like has, has gotten to the point because the school was originally an all boys school and they've only put about 10% of the student population as female at this point. So she has like beat down the guys until they're really not jerks anymore. Um... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's very odd. But then she has to hide the facts that after school, she works at a maid cafe because her family's poor. Really bizarre story. 
but it's fascinating because they do. It is a good way to look at like the differences in the society and in anime and manga of femininity and masculinity, because it compares a girl being feminine in the evenings but masculine during the day. Mm-hmm. Very interesting look at that. Um, and I think the other one that I have to suggest is. <laughs> If any of y'all haven't read Bloom Into You, it's precious. It's my precious little Yuri manga that I love. No, that's awesome. And that's good because I do, like, like you were mentioning at the beginning, there are certain animes that kind of rise to the top of popularity and notoriety. And it's very hard to break out of that. Even if you are someone who enjoys a shounen or a certain genre that is popular, it's still very hard to break out of that what is you know, like the Naruto's, the Bleach's, the One Piece's, all of all of that, and get a bit deeper into the genre and a bit less of what's commercially marketable and viable a bit, I guess. For me, I actually just spend time because I live like, I want to say like five minutes away from a bookstore and then like 10 minutes away from a bookstore. Mm -hmm. So there are, both of them have really good manga sections. Oh, nice. So I'll just go into the manga section and explore and like find a book that catches my eye and read it and see if there's an anime. You know, it's hard to explore unless you explore in real life at this point, or unless you go into those deep dives that often end up finding really disturbing stuff that should never have been made. <laughs> Yeah, because a lot of things you're not going to find on one of those top 10 best of, you know, yeah. <laughs> lists or like, you know, the top 100 anime of all time and you go through about eight and they're all the same. So. Naruto, Naruto 3, three Naruto <laughs> 8. I've never seen Naruto. <laughs> I've, I've seen it. It's a bit of a lot. I used to read it before I started watching it. I enjoy, I think I enjoyed reading it more than the anime, but I, because I collected Shonen Jumps back in the day. <laughs> which again i wish they had some shoujo jumps because i i do i do enjoy it as a genre and i think it's interesting and i think what's more interesting whatever one you're into is being presented with the option because it's nice mm. to have the choice to even see what you're into because another thing that might be putting some people off is that because it's so hard to find and it might come across as very very different from the anime that you're used to because anime have genres and very specific tropes to the style that they're working with and that's just how it is and so shoujo has some very specific tropes that if you're not used to them they might come across as excessively girly especially because over here we don't really play with tropes like that anymore at least and i think another interesting thing about accessibility is that from what i've seen shoujo manga tends to go out of print more than shonen does mm -hmm. I actually, I have a friend, she's basically like my big sister, um, and she mailed me some manga that she read when she was little, and it's called Pretar, Pretar. It's a really interesting Snow White retelling. Okay. She sent me the first two. I went online and I was like, are there any more? Because this story doesn't seem finished. There were a total of four of them. They don't publish any of them anymore. And this has been like less than 10 years. They also don't pu publish the anime anymore. So mm. it's hard It's hard to find like things that aren't out of print mm -hmm. anymore. Like even Fruits Basket, which is one of the original like really popular ones, they don't sell it in like easy to purchase manga form. They sell it in these big like expensive volumes now. So they make it hard to access. Sorry, I keep moving my hand over because my beds aren't here and I burned my fingers trying to pour boiling water into my tea earlier. Shoot. So, and my bed is cold. Oh, like, hmm. I'm, just, I'm pondering. I'm pondering the shoujo situation. But, um, I know think, it's a very, it's layered. Do you think that the appeal is there? Like, do you think that if it was more available, more accessible, the appeal would be there? Or do you think it would be something that because of the current cultural climate about what constitutes a strong woman, that some people might be afraid to admit they liked it in the same way that some people are afraid to admit that they like, say, a Fifty Shades of Grey or something that is viewed as, you know, excessively feminine. Although there's more Fifty Shades of Grey. I know people don't think that's well written. So there's a bit more of that there. But like, yeah. maybe a better example in the same way that people don't want to admit that they like romance romantic comedy movies or, you know, a yeah. good romance novel or something like that. I think, and I think that it can be similar. I think that some of them, like Sailor Moon, is almost 
too mainstream for a lot of people I know to want to admit if they like it. Because mm. um, especially in teenagers, hi, I'm a teenager. Teenagers suck. Um, especially in modern teenagers, you get this whole thing where, like, if it's too mainstream, it's not cool. And they don't, like... These people, like, will bash on hipsters and then do the exact same thing. And it's it's kind of sad. So the ones that are easily accessible are too popular for, these, for you know, a lot of people. But some of the ones that aren't easily accessible are shameful because they're too girly. And it's very similar. I think it's, you know, you might not want to admit it, but it's easy to like. It's fun. It's a lot less serious than a lot of shown in. It's it's not, you know, we're gonna die and <laughs> this guy is cute. But I don't want to date him because I just want to date anime boys, which is the plot of an actual anime. <laughs> no, I think that I think a lot of it comes down to the conflation of what one consumes and likes and one's self identity. Because the two things do not have to be mutually they don't have to be paired together. They can be different. They can be very separate one can enjoy like for example one can enjoy like the girliest frilliest thing and not necessarily be girly or frilly themselves like it doesn't necessarily have to equal how you present yourself or how you want to be perceived in the world but i do feel that a lot of times there is this sense that you are what you like which can be yeah. a very dangerous sentiment and it's and it's there are two sides because a lot of people find their identities in what they like mm -hmm. in a really healthy way yeah but it also makes it hard for others to find what they like because they're too scared to find something that's not socially appropriate for who they they want to be or who they are, mm -hmm. air quotes. So there are two sides of that, and I think that it makes it a very a very tricky line. Mm -hmm. I gesture with my hands a lot. Oh, I do too. <laughs> I think the thing with like finding like fandom and finding oneself in it is there's always that need to keep that that healthy perspective of even if it's something that is really helping you and you're enjoying it and it means a lot to you being able to take that step back and acknowledge that it is just a piece of media and entertainment that there are people taking it in multiple different ways because there can be a danger if you become overly attached or overly invested to the point where you can no longer separate that then it moves from being a healthy thing to being a very unhealthy thing, which can lead to a lot of fandom toxicity and fandom bashing back and forth, you know? <laughs> That's how that happens. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's it's important to be able to separate yourself from, from work. It's important to be able to separate your identity from them. And it's also important for these works to be easily accessible for people. Yeah, because they they do deserve to be discussed. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having an, a healthy, robust discussion about these works and what they mean and how they're presented to different people and what they mean to different people. But the danger, again, becomes when you only hear one perspective. Yeah. And that's the problem that we have in a lot of things, a lot of <laughs> fandoms. Uh, like, my best friend has me watching Yuri on Ice right now. It's great, but, like, from the beginning, she's just, like, sexualizing it intensely, and, yes, it sexualizes itself, but, like, having my best friend over here in the corner, like, oh, my God, the thing is happening, makes it a lot more intense. <laughs> she's watched it 50 times. That's intense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's maybe a little over that boundary of, of fandom and self. <laughs> I think there can be, it can be okay if you have a bit of self-awareness about it. But the thing is, it's very difficult to be self-aware. Like, it takes it takes a lot of practice to hit a level of introspection and self-awareness to be able to see yourself and see when you are getting a bit too invested in something. And yeah. sometimes you, that investment can be in good fun. You know, like you're just really enjoying something and you can take that step back. But it really it really depends. Like everybody takes to things so differently that it's it's fascinating. But for you, what do you think makes a strong female character? I think a strong female character is a character who relies on herself to at least some extent and mm. believes in herself. And that's like all it takes. Mm. I mean, you don't need to be physically strong or the smart, you know, super smart. You just have to be able to rely on yourself and be somewhat independent. Uh, for me, a strong female character, I define strength in two ways. There's um, 
there's strength as in the character is competent, and then there's strength as in the strength of the character within the narrative. Because for me, they're two very different things, because I believe that a weak character can be a strong character if the character is well-rounded and fleshed out. And I feel that sometimes a lot of female characters, unfortunately, aren't given that choice because there's the fear that they will be perceived of as weak. Like, for example, there's a great debate in the Sherlock fandom about Molly Hooper, but whether or not yes. she is a strong character or not. And to me, the answer is yes, because she's well-rounded. Like, yes, yes. she might have a, a crippling crush and it's affecting how she lives her life and she's not being as assertive of it she could be but she's a character she's a fully fleshed character and to me that makes her interesting because for me i just want good characters i don't care if they're flawed or weak because the best thing about representation is when there are multiple different types because a lot of times when so, uh, when a trope becomes popular in the mainstream it's all you end up seeing such as when we have the um female bad action lady trope which i enjoy but there are times when it it overtakes and it becomes the only thing and then you stop <laughs> seeing anything else it's it's the exact same problem but reverse from when all you have is the romantic comedy trope like you need all of them for a more well-rounded viewing of what's possible in my opinion at least oh no definitely and it it's kind of almost harmful to only have you know romance romance but at the same time you want some of it like, yeah. I'm a hopeless romantic. I love Jane Austen. But if you just inundate me with Jane Austen, I will start, like, crying because it's just too much. <laughs> you know, it's and, it's, and it's also hard to draw a line in mm-hmm. some ways. Because, like, what was it? And I can't think of it now. There was something, Mulan. I've heard people recently talk about Mulan as, like, an like, non-romantic movie, Hmm. which I get, but at the same time, she very clearly has a romantic plot. It's very clearly in there. And as someone who does not, you know, who does not see that, I don't understand where the argument's coming from. Hmm. And I get that it's it's not as prevalent as some other pieces of it, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, like, at the end, there's clearly, like, her family immediately expects her to marry him. Like, mm-hmm. there's, there's romance there. <laughs> I've read, I've read a I couple don't... of intriguing readings about Mulan. The no romance angle, the bisexual Shen angle. Like, there are, there are a bunch of very interesting ways to take that story. And I think they're all intriguing readings. But the thing is, uh, for some, I don't understand why they place the romance as a negative or a less than. I've seen that a lot. I was reading a Daisy Ridley interview about how um, she's longing for intimacy in the next Star Wars film, but not necessarily romance. To which I think, great, intimacy is, I love intimacy, but, um, but there's not necessarily anything wrong with romance, and a romance doesn't have to weaken a character. And it doesn't have to weaken a female character if it is properly articulated and well thought out. Like, I feel that sometimes there is this thought that romance automatically equals weak, it automatically equals codependent, and that the character, the female character is just no longer going to have the agency of being able to be herself. And that's not the case. It doesn't have to be, not if it's well written. (laughs) There are some versions, I mean, there are some stories where the female character meets the man and is immediately weak in the knees and just doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only reading of most stories there are several there's one really good story that i read recently that does have a romance but it's more of like an asexual romance Mm. there's no there's no kissing there's nothing physical but it's a very like mental like partnership romance kind of in the same way that you get like people are like oh sherlock and john watson are have you know are in a relationship but it's more textual and Mm -hmm. a little bit less sexual yeah um it's in the book a madness so discreet by mindy mcginnis which is really a really good look at lots of things including the asylum um the asylum social structure in the 1800s in america Mm -hmm. but it really does a good job of uh, of looking at having a romance not but not making it the biggest thing and making it nicely asexual so that it was it almost felt like that kind of representation which is nice i think that's the other thing too that people don't realize is that people tend not to consume only one type of media like they may have a favorite 
or something that they gravitate towards over and over. But most people consume multiple different types of things. And so they're bombarded by many different story types, many different narratives, many different forms of representation, because there is often, I think, a, a misplaced fear that people are going to absorb these you know, negative stereotypes or negative thoughts, especially like old Disney is a great like aspect of this where people are like, I'm not going to let my daughter say watch Snow White because it says that she needs to cook and clean for a man in her house. To which that's firstly, that's only one reading of what is happening in that story. And secondly, that's not the only representation of womanhood that your daughter is ever going to receive. There are going to be so yeah. many others, not just from media, but from real life, from experiences, all kinds of stuff. So that fear, I think, is a bit overinflated for what it's... Also, there is also the fact that you can... There's so much discussion to talk about and people have the capacity for critical thought to take away what they think because obviously if, if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't have all these arguments against it. Everybody would just have accepted it and moved on. <laughs> it's, and it's very much like Snow White can be viewed like that. It can also be viewed that she's basically paying them for letting her stay in a place that will inevitably save her life, you know. There, 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 there are a couple different readings. It's like there are multiple readings to Disney's The Little Mermaid that I enjoy. Like, there's the one reading that, like, is completely negative. She gave up her, her voice for a man. Her voice is her agency. She gave it up. But then there's the alternate reading that if you follow it through and the voice is her agency, he doesn't love her until she has it. So, really, you could follow that through and that the message being that you won't have anybody unless you have yourself and your agency to present themselves with. You can't be just an empty shell who's pretty because that's not going to cut it. So like there are multiple, multiple readings and ways to take it. And that's part of what I love about it, being able to examine the different aspects of ways you can view things. Exactly. I, uh, there's actually, for Little Mermaid, there's another reading that states that Ariel actually, like, she didn't give up her legs for a man. She gave them up for an adventure she wanted. If she had wanted to give them up for Eric, she would have given him up immediately after meeting mm -hmm. him. Instead, she waits until she's just had it with not being heard, which is why Ursula takes her voice, because that's her greatest fear and that's her greatest sadness is because she doesn't feel heard. Mm -hmm. I like that reading. I like that reading a lot. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, I discovered a new YouTube channel that does a bunch of uh, Disney princess like feminist theory, and I am obsessed with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, honestly, the Disney princesses need more of that because they're so they're it's so easy to bash on them, and like they get a lot more bashing than they deserve, and like a whole bunch of negativity, even towards the term princess, that is honestly not that deserved. The thing is, both are fine. It's okay to not be a princess and it's okay to be a princess. That's the thing is that they should both be okay. I think they're both okay as long as you choose them. Yeah. No, like, of course, like, the harm tends to come from when it becomes an overwhelming group thing. Like, when someone starts to think that all women are princesses or something like that. That's when it becomes a bit, you know, problematic that they all need saving. Save the damsel. And all of, all of that stuff. It's it's a very complicated mash of everything. It is. <laughs> it's just intense. Just an intense mash of everything. The best dissection of the princess that I've read is actually a little graphic novel called Princess Princess Ever After. Mm -hmm. It's adorable. Um, it has, instead of a pr prince coming to save the princess, it's another princess. And it's this whole, it's just, it's short, it's cute, it's for little kids. It's very queer. It's amazing. It's the best dissection of the princess. Because you have a very feminine princess and then a less feminine princess mm -hmm. acting as the prince. It's really interesting. And see, what I love about your um, explanations, too, is that I think even just by talking about this, you're um, disproving one of the theories that people have, which is that people who enjoy shoujo, feminine things and stuff, they aren't aware. That they're just, like, blithely, you know, unaware that they're living out, you know, these quote-unquote stereotypes and everything. But most people are aware of what they're presenting <laughs> to the world. Yeah, it's not, it's, uh, yes, I know that most of the time I'm in the world as, like, a ditzy pastel weirdo. <laughs> and that's a very shoujo, almost a very shoujo trope in a way, but I'm aware of that, and that's kind of who I like being. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, oh, this is who I am because of what I read, it's this is who I am, and I like reading about people who are like me. No, it's, I think that's very interesting, because it, it, it can be a very chicken-in-the-eggy kind of situation, you know, of like, 
which came first? Like, you know, am I a nerd because I was introduced to nerd culture and so I just absorbed it vicariously like a sponge or am I a nerd because I like it? You know, like they're just... <laughs> All of the above. Exactly, both. <laughs> Option C. Everything. So speaking of um, shoujo, how do you, like, do you find that there are a lot adapted? I mean, even if they're not very much easy to find, like, have you been able to find them on maybe some of the lesser reputable sites or what? <laughs> Yes and no. Um, a lot of the more popular ones, like Madoka and stuff like that, are adapted. But a lot of what I read, a lot of the more recent ones aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot of, of fairly recent stuff. And a lot of the older stuff, I'm looking at the book. Yeah. Um, a lot of the older stuff is adapted, but a lot of the newer stuff isn't. And I don't know if that's a translation thing or if that's the fact that there's so much of it and yet not enough of it at the same time. There's, there are so many of them that are good, but so few people read them that it's hard for people who are making anime to be like, yes, this will be profitable, instead of making the next Naruto sequel. What do you find the fandom landscape is like in the shoujo world? It's pretty it's pretty fun. I, uh, I don't interact with it too much, like on Tumblr, because I'm scared of Tumblr, <laughs> unless it's like educational Tumblr. <laughs> But I, uh, I have uh, friends who are into it, and it's really nice to just be able to discuss. It's, it's, a very, it's a very positive. It's more positive than a lot of fandom. And I think part of that is just because of the fluffy nature. Do you find it to be very active, or...? Yes and no. Um, it's a good fandom, but it's not super active because of the kind of ebbing and flowing of popularity and of publishing, where shoujo, especially the anime, is concerned because there is not enough shoujo anime being published. Although part of that is because shoujo and shonen have kind of started to mash. Like Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, I would personally consider it a shoujo, but it has some elements of that kind of adventure mm -hmm. stories of a, of a shonen. So it's kind of, it's a shoujo kind of edging towards, you know, that, that dividing line which I think makes it a little bit harder currently to judge the difference because a lot of them, instead of having lots of this and lots of that or a little bit of this, lots of that, they're kind of meeting somewhere near the middle. I think that's the natural evolution. And I think that definitely over here, we'll definitely see more of that because that will be more appealing to the Western viewer base in terms of what gets translated and passed across because that is something that, for our audience, it, we're much more familiar with that and hence more comfortable with it. Because part of what comes across too is that you need that element of familiarity because when things, like with the more Eastern style anime, like you don't see a lot of those over here. They don't tend to make it too much, especially if they have that different narrative flow than what we're used to. They don't, they don't often make it. And there are so many that are like, borderline like a lot of girl like shoujo mm -hmm. but it is very sexualized shoujo so yes cheesecake uh, <laughs> cheesecake <laughs> yep um but it's shoujo that specifically sexualizes the girls in a way that makes it look like shonen mm -hmm. if that makes sense like a lot of the monster masume the kind of that kind of stuff is kind of borderline because it does sexualize women in a way that a lot of women at least straight women aren't that into or and even queer women like i don't think i've met many queer women who would like who liked over sexualized women in any sort because they understand what it's like to be like that so it's kind of there's a lot of there's a lot of diversity but a lot of it can be either grouped no it's very interesting like the cheesecake discussion is very interesting because it's so blatant in a lot of anime in a way that lots of things over here it's blatant too but it's a different kind of blatant like they're like yeah. sometimes the the anime just straight up stops because we gotta have some cheesecake and we gotta put that out there and yep. that's it's Where's interesting the over there it's interesting because like i know that there are lots of opponents to it both here and there but i know that there is also the viewpoint that it's an it's an outlet and that media is a space for being an outlet, which which is also an argument to be made. So it's just a very, 
it's very fascinating. I read a dissection of Misty the other day, which was very interesting, like Misty from Pokemon. And um, how she was constructed to be like a safe fantasy for like prepubescent boys who were just at that point who before they were going to start getting interested in like, you know, older girls, but we're starting to get interested in girls, which is why she's tomboyish, but also has like that really like, you know, revealing costume of the super short hot pants and like the crop top. And it was just, it was interesting. And I was like, you know what? It is interesting. The idea of having that space, kind of like how you have those movies like Labyrinth, you know, where it's like, that movie is very much about the awakening of being attracted to somebody for the first time. But yeah. so I think that I think that there's spaces for that, but it's just when does it become excessive and at what point can you tell when something is doing that versus just being straight up exploitative and just because we want the spank material, which is something yeah. else. That's a thing. <laughs> a lot of people are into i and it's 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 a very it's a very interesting discussion i really would like you if you can find it again to send me the link to that article on misty because that's a really interesting idea but yeah it's and it's fascinating like with labyrinth i know someone whose little sister who's like 12 is like obsessed with labyrinth because you hit a time when that's the kind of thing that some people a lot of people want to experience because you hit an age when it's like, oh, I wonder what this is, oh. There's that awareness. And for a lot of people, their first crush, whoever it may be, is often older. It's, it's often an older person, like someone who is more mature because that's what you're kind of coming into is this idea of maturity. So often the person that you gravitate towards is this more archetypical, mature, you know, and hence older, <laughs> David Bowie. But... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. If your first crush wasn't David Bowie, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> but speaking of, you also wanted to bring up the difference between shipping in um, like an anime versus a manga. So like the visual versus the print medium format. So what exactly about that do you find is unique to each? I think that anime get distributed more. Like manga are more readily available. But anime is often something that more people are into because you like you can find it on TV and it's like easier to access a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something it's interesting because I feel like you can almost get more intense if you're reading it because you have that head you you know you're in your head the entire thing is in your head, so it's not you know, like an outward source. And it's print, so, you, you know, you can kind of imagine what happens between panels, in a way. Um, with anime, it's all kind of laid out there. You know, they have voices. It's all out there, especially, it's like the difference between books and movies. In a book, you can imagine yourself, or you can imagine what the character looks like and how they talk and everything. Um, but in a visual format, you can't. And it's a little different with manga, because obviously there are pictures. But... Mm -hmm. it, it's really interesting to look at to look at how people ship differently in both in both formats. No, it is because I find that in general, visual mediums tend to get a more active and intense and larger fan base for sure than for like manga neck books last like when a book fandom explodes a book fandom really explodes but when a yeah. book fandom is kind of in the middle it often very much stays there and doesn't quite extend past that because you have like the mega juggernauts when it comes to bookdom but then you also have you know you're looking you read a book and you're like wow that was great i need to go and there's like two things <laughs> and you're like why this book was amazing there's a there's a book, um, Six of Crows. It's kind of in between the two. It has a pretty active fan base and a pretty intense fan base, but not one that's big enough to have more than two or three six about like the best crack ship ever. <laughs> which is the main couple and then my favorite couple as a threesome, it's it's precious. Nice. Um, yeah, it's 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 wonderful because the boyfriend of the one person doesn't exist in the story <laughs> and the two girls are like best friends and then the guy is like the, the girl and the guy have to be together mm -hmm. have to 
So it, it's just putting them all together and it's precious. It's precious. There are like two fix. <laughs> <laughs> there are like two fix and one of them is like, both of them are like half done and haven't been worked on in six months. Mm. Yeah, I've definitely <laughs> been there. <laughs> it's a oh, sad yeah. space. <laughs> sad days <laughs> and you go back and you check and you hope and just <laughs> from like that like the email i like archive of our own because they'll let you get email updates if mm -hmm. it's update i can't do so that like i can't like i just i need to go back and check myself the updates stress me out so i just need to go and physically check <laughs> of course then when you get one half the time it's oh i'm sorry this stick isn't going to be updated anymore I decided that I'm not that passionate about this fandom anymore. I can no. see that. Have you ever suddenly found yourself falling out of a fandom? Yes. A lot of stuff with the Percy Jackson fandom because, especially with the movies, everyone started getting really, like, intense. Um, and I, I, I still follow it. I still read some of the books. But... It's not the same. I like the musical. The musical's good. <laughs> so what would you deem as a fandom getting intense? Uh, lots of arguments. I don't deal with, I don't deal with intensity very well. I have very high anxiety. So when something gets like in your face, like almost, you know, like people are arguing, da, 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 da. I, I bow out, I run away, I go hide in the corner. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with the Percy Jackson fandom, a lot of it was like the disappointment, the sheer disappointment with the movies. Yeah. And everyone got really fired up. And then the thing that finally I just was out was the last book of the Heroes of Olympus series. Because that came out, a lot of people were like frustrated. Da, da, da. I never ended up reading it because I just, there was so much tension that I was like I'm not gonna my little fangirl heart won't be able to deal with this <laughs> and I just kind of just gave up on the entire thing. <laughs> no that's very interesting because I feel like a lot of people don't realize that fandom can actually stop you from consuming media or at least make you want to take a break that definitely happened to me with the Steven Universe fandom where I had to take a break where things just got real intense and everybody was bullying everybody left, right, and center. And it made the show less enjoyable vicariously. And that was like a feeling I had to fight because I was like, it's not the show's fault. The show is fine. But it's like, you'll be watching it and in the back of your head, you can kind of, you're just thinking like, oh, they're probably going to argue about that. And like, mm, somebody's not going to like that. And like, there's going to be a Tumblr post about that. And you know. <laughs> Even universe for me, I loved it. But it got to the point where it was hard because it was like 15 minutes episodes that it was hard to justify like watching them one at a time mm -hmm. for me. But then catching up was also hard. So I just, <laughs> I'm very, I'm very far behind. Um, and I need to catch up. But Hulu won't work on my laptop. So oh. <laughs> I may never catch up. <laughs> yeah, no, I kind of save it to binge because, because it is so short that, yeah, it is hard. Like, oh, new episode, 11 minutes. <laughs> Let me let me spend my little bit of time that I'm going to spend in front of a TV or a screen today watching this. So is that why you stay away from Tumblr because of the intensity of it or that's that's part of it. When I do Tumblr I normally just stick to like like, you know, learning stuff and, and the vlog brothers I do I I stalk their tumblers because they're positive humans most of the time. Mm -hmm. Also, Thomas Sanders. Just any anyone who's like positive, I try to stay to, where it's like happy things and positive things and not fandom shipping wars. Yeah, shipping wars can be they can be intense and they can blow up and they're always they're always fascinating to study in retrospect because. There comes a point where the fandom doesn't fade, but it's no longer in its peak or zenith, as I like to call it. And you look back and nobody cares half as much as they used to at that point. And you go back and look and it's like, wow, there was some intense insults bandied back and forth in this fan. I am looking forward to Voltron no longer being at its zenith just for that. So people can go back and look and be like, what happened? How did this happen to us? Just like excavating from the twenty, you know, twenty seventeen Tumblr, yeah. you know, our arch fandom archaeology. That should be that should be a YouTube series. Yeah, just someone dressed as an archaeologist <laughs> reviewing fandom Honestly. history. Yes. 
there should be more of stuff done about fandom history because it's fascinating. It's only going to become more fascinating as it becomes more and more entwined with what is actually being produced canonically because that's inevitable with the ease of access that we're going to see more and more of that. And as more and more people are able to voice their opinions about what they want to see and like actually be able to actively bring it into creation, it's going to be very interesting. It's, it's And it's fascinating. And you can tell, I mean, you see poster, like, there's going to be, like, a whole, like, generation of kids who are all made up fictional characters. You know, you, I mean, you see those all over the internet. But I feel like that generation of kids is also going to be the generation that's like, Mom, you were crazy. Why did you name me after a fictional character? Also, why did you scream at 0111nerd on Tumblr? Yeah, there's going to be... I always thought about that before I even had my daughter. I was like, one day... I'm going to be old and my daughter is going to come to me and ask me questions about the things she finds about me online and what do I want to be there because that is a very real concern. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's a, it really is like a valid concern and like oh, when you name your kids you got to you got to think it through. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for naming you. There is a whole generation of children named like Khaleesi right now. And I'm like, some of them are going to love it and some of them are going to hate it. So I, I have I have a pretty good like a pretty good name. I was named after a Celtic deity, which is fun. Nice. But I, I some days I'm like, you know, it would be really it would be really fun to just be named like Star. Something really random. Mm -hmm. Also name of a book character that half people half the people who are watching this don't know. Star Girl, Jerry Spinelli. It's a good book about growing up and being a hippie. I have lots of book recommendations if you if you can. <laughs> no, it's good. The world needs more book recommendations. More recommendations in general because it's very easy to get caught up in your fandom and then not realize that there's so many other things to explore out there that are just as fun. And it's, I think it's always fun to step outside your comfort zone sometimes and pick up something you don't think you'd like just to see how it is. Like, yeah, the worst thing that's going to happen is that you're going to be right and you didn't like it. So like, there's nothing, that's not that bad. The worst thing is you wasted $5 on that ebook. And I think, and I think the other thing is we were talking about like accessibility of stuff yes. earlier. You, when you're not, when people aren't recommending stuff, you end up in this rut of like what's really popular, what's, you know, what's, you know, the things that are easily accessible on the internet or through internet recommendations, which are normally going to be what is popular or mm -hmm. weird enough that people are like, this is a thing. Yeah, which, ne which doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best or something that you're even going to like. Although it is going to be interesting because accessibility is going to become a bit more varied as we have more and more of these streaming services, more and more things being published, people having to deal with like export and import prices. There are so many barriers to accessibility that people don't really think about. So there are lots of times when someone won't even be able to be fully involved in a work or a fandom, even if they wanted to, because of just issues of access. And that's absolutely fine. And that's part of why I'm such a proponent of everybody treating fans equally, even if they don't have equal knowledge, because sometimes a lot of it comes from not having equality of access. And so it's like everybody should have a chance to have a, a fun time in fandom, you know? Yeah. I, I do a lot of stuff on Discord, and there was someone on a server, and this was not about nerd culture, but I feel like mm -hmm. it pertains extremely well to a lot of people's views. Mm -hmm. Someone was calling um, someone who had had to leave the server a fake mm. because real people or, like, real people of this subculture, real people don't let criticism hurt them. Mm. <laughs> What real people are these? <laughs> Criticism hurts even the thickest amongst us. <laughs> it really does. I know. Like, even if you had decided that, that wasn't, like, a thing you cared about, it still kind of hurts. Yeah. It's never, it's never fun to be criticized. Like, it's not, a, it's not an experience where you're like, oh, yay, I'm so glad that someone pointed that out to me, even whether it's valid or not, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My also, is Okay. I am a newbie to Discord. Explain it to me. Explain to me the Discord. <laughs> it's it's kind of 
I don't want to say this because we're on Skype, and I don't know if they're like Skype people out there. They'll just get... shut it down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's uh, especially with like the teens and the twenty something. Mm-hmm. It's phasing out Skype in a way. Mm-hmm. It's they have video chat, they have servers, they have a bunch of different things. YouTubers will set up a lot of Discord servers a lot of the time. They'll set up Discord servers or like groups of people who are like all into different things um like i'm on one for crocheting okay i have one that's for baking and movie watching that is dead but i don't care it still exists no like because um, a bunch of my um fans keep telling me they're like you gotta get on discord and i'm like first i need to understand what it is <laughs> and then... no it's it's a really good way to interact be able to interact with people mm. um i'm actually I have a friend, I'm on a Discord server um, that's set up for, shocker, the Vlogbrothers people. Mm. It's one of the one of the best Discord servers that I've heard of or ever been on. It's mm. wonderful. Um, everyone is super active, and I've made so many of my really good friends on there. One of whom is throwing on, on Thursday, um, has planned an internet quinceanera for me because she is excited. Nice. Because <laughs> one day I was like, yeah, 15 isn't exactly the most interesting birthday. And she's like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. You're wrong. No, so, that's awesome. So Discord is, there's video chat, there's voice chat, there's group voice chat. There are, you can create DM groups, you can create like servers. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to be able to communicate with people in a bunch of different ways. Speaking of like communication and fandom and stuff, do you create any of your own fan works or? In my head. <laughs> um, I've done some fan art that was really bad <laughs> as we've all done. Yes. <laughs> I, um, I have a piece that is somewhere in the depths of random art supplies of Laura and Carmilla from Carmilla <laughs> from the web series. Um, that was really bad, but that was before I knew how to like shade or do anything like that. <laughs> so it just looks like a girl with like a bustier and then like weird dark circles underneath of it. Mm-hmm. You know, that whole thing. Yep. And I have like fanfic worlds in my head and I've also written technically a fan song for classic novels. Uh, but I don't, publish anything because I have not that good at it. <laughs> Is it something you think you would ever want to publish or put out there or what? I I would if it would didn't suck. Aw. That's yep. Yeah, I would if it wasn't if it was better. Uh, the only thing that I have out there that's easily accessible is I have fan art of JD from Heathers. Okay. On on t- uh, both my old Tumblr and my one of my one of my thousand mini instagrams mm-hmm. was so. it difficult for you to put that out there or not really because i knew that like five people would see it <laughs> it was just kind of like you know what i drew this thing and i don't hate it as much as i normally do let's post it so that two of my friends can see it no it's awesome though like it's hard to post stuff out there it it really is because again like you said like there is that standard that everybody holds themselves to that you want to post something that you're happy with, you know, and everybody has a different threshold for what that means when it comes to what they're working with. So there's definitely that threshold um, for a lot of people, mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Some people are just like, I, this is the best piece of artwork ever. This squiggle is amazing. I'm going to post it. Um, but a lot of people are like, you know what, if it doesn't look like remotely like a face, I, no, but yeah. And, and I have wanted to do fan fan works, but you're on a spinny chair because my desk is not, <laughs> does not have a good background. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like a lot of people post fan works that they never want to finish. Like they post partial, like I have an issue with people who post like partial fanfics that they never plan to finish. If it's something that you have in your brain that you don't know if you're gonna ever want to finish writing, just just write it. Just just stay up one night and write it. That's that's what I do. Mm. If I have something that I want to do, I just stay up all night. 
It's um, hard. Like, I, I don't know if anybody ever thinks they're going to fall out of a fandom when they start the fic. Or some people, um, I know, they write themselves into a corner or, like, they thought they had an idea and it just falls apart halfway yeah. through. And that's the thing because, like, some people, everybody fics differently. Like, some people come at it with it completely constructed in their head and they know where it's going to go. And some people are just kind of winging it as it goes along. And also, life life happens yeah, and it life. just completely and like sometimes life happens for a long time like a year or two and it's hard to get back to that headspace where you were after a year or two although i will forever also on the readership side of it always be sad when that does happen yeah. and it's to a fic that i was really enjoying as a reader i'm like no give me back my characters give me back all of the male characters from different musicals forming a very gay band <laughs> It was, it's a great fic. <laughs> what's your, um, what's your favorite site, like, to get the fix on? Is AO3? AO3. I do some Tumblr fix, but those can be kind of weirdly formatted. <laughs> yeah, because it, yeah, Tumblr, you need to know how to, how to navigate it and stuff, and not everybody does, so. It's not the most intuitive if you're new to it, in all fairness. <laughs> I've been on and off of it. I had a Tumblr that is deleted now mm -hmm. it, is, it does not exist um but it was when i was like 10 it was like girly girl stuff dot tumblr dot com i was stupid and i think i posted one thing on it before just 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 not being on tumblr for three years <laughs> <laughs> tumblr's hard guys tumblr's hard <laughs> so you got into fandom like and posting and being active in it really early then yeah i uh i grew up with an obsession with books and, and culture and Disney movies, you know, all of that. And then it just never ended. You know, the first, the first fandoms I was in were like children's books, like grade. I love Edie Baker as an author. Mm -hmm. I love what she writes. As I got older, you know, we hit like the Harry Potter and then, you know, the, the Percy Jackson was always, always in that. It's, it's been lots of fandom, lots of fandom. I had this thing when I, I was, I was watching Buffy. I'm a huge fan of Buffy. Mm -hmm. And I started like December 20 something or other. And I told myself that I was not allowed to have my, tw my 13th birthday mm -hmm. until I finished Buffy because my birthday is in February. So mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to finish Buffy before then. And I did. No, nice. it was good. And then they took it off Netflix. No, it's it's still all up on here for us, thankfully, because I'm showing it to my husband for the first time because he never watched it back in the day. So we're we're marathoning our way through it, and he's enjoying it because it's enjoyable. So <laughs> connect me to Canadian Netflix. <laughs> well, Canadian, you don't want it. It like honestly, it's lacking so many things. <laughs> well, Netflix is gonna be interesting because it's gonna move so hard into making its own content so that's going to be fascinating to see i'm excited to see how that goes or if we're just returning to the era of multiple cable networks to get all your things because i'm already in that boat having to watch star trek discovery on a different server than netflix and well, my family employs amazon prime netflix hulu and crunchyroll so <laughs> you're already there <laughs> you're already, we're already there yeah yeah we, uh, we had Three of them, and then my mom was like, we need to get an Amazon Fire Stick, because they're on sale on Amazon. And then we immediately got a Hulu account. So based on your family history, then, you you, you probably are going to bring fandom with you. It's like, you're just going to continue on with it. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i I'm never going to not be a fangirl. Mm -hmm. that's, that's impossible. I, uh, <laughs> looking at my room, it's full of prints. Like, there's literally not an inch of my room that is not fandomized. Mm-hmm. It's, there isn't. I, I have way too many prints everywhere. I'm actually currently hoping that Ikea bothers to ship my order of, like, more frames for more prints. Everything, every inch of it is covered in fandom, and I don't think that I'm ever going to stop wanting to cover myself and my world in fandom. Mm -hmm. Has it been, has it made it more fun having parents who are so engaged in fandom on their own? Yes, it, it's wonderful because I can, like, my mom and I are currently watching Made Sama together, which I mentioned earlier. We're watching that anime together. We, um, she, we book club a lot. My mom, my stepdad, and I, um, I'm a music geek as well. Mm -hmm. I can't tell by the ukulele that just lives on my bookcase. Mm -hmm. 
and he and I work with music music together some, and we all video game. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of nice to just be able to hang out and you know suggest books to my mom or get book suggestions from her. Um, it's wonderful. We actually we do. I'm homeschooled, mm-hmm. so we do, we book club our books, and we, I just read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Nice. <laughs> And actually, you just filmed a feminist, I don't even know if it's ever going to be up on anything, but a feminist critique of it based looking at Trillian mm. and how she fit into the story. Because it doesn't, it doesn't fit the Bechdel test. But she's still really strong and arguably the most competent of everyone in this story. Yeah, because the Bechdel test is interesting because there are certain works that I don't expect to pass it. So it's not something that I feel should be applied to all works. Like if you're, like if you're looking at something like, say, the Seven Samurai, or, like, some some work where it's explicitly male for a reason, because there are only men in, like, let's say it's an army movie where it was, like, an all-male, like, squadron or something. I'm like, well, if I watch that movie, I'm not expecting it to pass the test, and I'm not even going to apply the test to it, because that's not fair to that work, because that's not the story it's trying to tell. It's, it's very different when you're working with a medium that does have multiple female characters, and then they never seem to cross paths. Like, that's an entirely different kettle of fish than, you know, you're watching someone like World War II movie like Dunkirk or something. Yeah, I uh, actually, I think the most, the most offended I've ever been as a fangirl mm-hmm. was when a couple friends, they're not my friends anymore, partly because of this, uh, when a couple friends were chatting and they were talking about the new Star Wars thing that's supposed to be built at Disney World. Okay. Or, Disneyland or something. And... I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. And they were, they both looked at me and they're like, we didn't expect you to be into Star Wars. And I'm like, what? They were like, we didn't think it had enough girls in it for you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then that's followed up with, and I was like, oh, but Princess Leia. And they're like, Princess Leia isn't cool. And I'm like, plus this is like only six months after Carrie Fisher passed away. Bless her soul. Mm-hmm. <laughs> disrespecting the princess <laughs> i it was it was i think the most offended i have ever been if not just the most offended i've ever been in fandom <laughs> it's always i find it intriguing when people assume that they know what you're going to like or not like because it's it's harder than people would think like sometimes it's it's like going through a netflix like because you watched list you know it's just not always the most accurate representation of what you're gonna get you know like just because i watched pitch perfect does not mean i want to watch 10 other yeah girls doing acapella yeah no more acapella movies (laughs) <laughs> I don't need this many. <laughs> no, that's like that's what's intriguing about fandom and what people don't think about a lot of times is that it can be very multifaceted and very different. Like again, like just because you liked Star Trek doesn't mean you have to dislike Star Wars. Like there are there are so many things that you don't have to fall into the fandom's nice little box about what people think you should think based on your prior experiences. There are so many things that draw people to a work and so many different ways to experience it. But going back to like generational fandom, I think that's something that's going to be so fun because now that the taboo around fandom has begun to lessen in certain corners, although it is still very much intact for many, there are many places where now it's much cooler to be a nerd and be involved in nerd culture and not let that go and continue it into adulthood. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun for a lot of people to be able to share that fandom generationally or even for people who had that fandom inside them but were a bit scared to sh- to share it to now have that space to know like you know what it's it's cool and it's fine and i can talk about it in public and it's not gonna the world's not gonna fall apart it's gonna be okay <laughs> exactly exactly and it's and it's and you see it with like the growing amount of like nerd t-shirts that are popping up mm-hmm. i think everyone almost everyone i know owns like five of them Mm -hmm. as opposed to 10 years ago and everyone would have most likely owned owned one or less yeah or not necessarily wanting to display their fandom that prominently in that way yeah it's a very interesting thing and then as as more as it's more okay more people get into it because more people hear about it Mm -hmm. which is interesting because that then in itself creates uh some fandom can get very hierarchical very quickly where there people want to assert that they are a better fan than others and i find that t-shirts are often a place where that happens because there people are often accused of just you know getting a t-shirt and not being like a true enough fan or not liking the fandom enough and 
it, it just ends up being a mess and one of those things where it's like let people enjoy their fandom how they want a and b there's nothing wrong with a person who just finds a cool t-shirt who maybe necessarily isn't into it because you never know the t-shirt could be the gateway like there are so many different ways to enter a fandom that you know don't judge exactly i uh i love uh, doctor who but i don't watch it that often because mm. it's hard i don't do super well with like a lot of info like a lot of seasons like if i have 20 seasons to watch it's not happening. I have books I want to read. I'm not going to sit down. I have a hard time sitting down and, like, being like, okay, I'm going to watch one thing for this amount of time. Like, mm-hmm. I – feels like a waste of time to me a lot of times. Like, I don't like – you know, a lot of people go out, like, oh, let's go to the movies, like, as a date or as, like, a thing they do with their friends. I don't like it because you don't get to talk. Mm. You don't get to interact with people, and I feel like you lose that in a way with movies. Um – but I have a hard time sitting down. But I do like Doctor Who. I watch. We watch it every Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's, I do marathons of it. And I have a Doctor Who shirt that I'm terrified to wear because I know that people who, some people who know me love Doctor Who and don't think that I am a Doctor Who nerd girl. Mm-hmm. Which is true and not true at the same time. So it's... Yeah, because you can be a fan of something, but not necessarily be able to pass that fan litmus test of, say, like, you know, knowing every single detail of everything, but still genuinely enjoy the fandom and what it represents. And it it can be difficult for people who are more into a fandom to accept that, because when you get, you know, like, when you get hyper into something, like, there is that assumption that you want to know everything, but that's not always the case for everybody, and that's absolutely fine, because everybody enjoys things in that different way. Yeah. Trying to close, I have a cup of water on the floor, because, again, I am in pain. Mm. I literally poured scalding hot water all over my hand, which is not not a not a fun thing, kid. Yeah, don't, don't try this at home. <laughs> don't, don't try this at home. Maybe be a little bit more careful when rushing to make tea. But yeah, so I completely under I completely agree. People, the fandom litmus test as a, as a thing that exists is kind of dumb. It definitely can be because it can be so limiting, and it can also discourage people who might be wanting to engage in that fandom from engaging it and sharing that enjoyment with you which is i'm definitely in several fandoms that are guilty of that like i'm a huge trekkie but the trek fandom is a huge contender for making what episode did that happen in that was season two episode one and as someone who actually knows that it was season two episode one i'm very careful to make sure that i do not do that because (laughs) yeah it's not it's not there's no point there's no point in making somebody feel bad because they don't know something because most times people aren't trying to be a quote unquote fake fan. They're just trying to engage in something that they know you like and they're making the effort. And so there's no reason to shoot somebody down when they're making the effort to engage with you. That's just, that's negative for everybody. It's that, and it's also, there are people that I've interacted with at least that will literally, like, they don't even know what fandoms you're in but they will, like, just throw random references into conversation and stuff like that and then, like, get mad at you if you don't understand what they're saying, Mm. if that makes sense. Those people annoy me. (laughs) (laughs) I had, um, I had some friends who used to quote Firefly, um, to each other all the time before I'd watched Firefly. And so I had um, no idea what was happening, and I was quickly chastised (laughs) that it was the greatest show of all time. And, um... (laughs) I watched it and I enjoyed it. It is definitely up there for me of my sci-fi shows that I enjoy, but it can definitely, like, I don't mind when people do that because, like, I know that I, as someone who makes Dune jokes all the time to people who have never seen Dune and never are going to see Dune, like, sometimes you're just doing it because you think it's it's funny and you don't necessarily clue into the fact that not everybody's seen Dune, but then it's that follow-through of getting upset. Like, you can't get upset if someone doesn't have your reference point. You can't accept, yeah. expect everybody to have your reference point because yeah. they're just not go- they're just not going to. Like, there's, there's too much stuff out there for everybody to have consumed the same stuff that you've consumed or even to remember it. Because there are times when I've seen so many things with my dad, like we watch movies together all the time, and I'll be like, oh, you remember like when we watched Queen on the Dam? Then he'll be like, what? We saw Queen on the Dam together. <laughs> and I'll be like, dad, this was like an important moment for me. 
dad and rice is our queen come on <laughs> how dare you know what <laughs> it's like it's absolutely fine like because different things are important to different people and it's important to remember that speaking of so of of the who that you've watched who's your favorite doctor this is gonna be uh, weird um i like no weird I like 11 and 9, because 9 is my mom's favorite doctor, mm. and so I'm, like, I'm in that because of that, but 11 is just quirky and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Also, the new doctor is queen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reserve judgment, because I, I have, I've got so much who to catch up on. I'm so behind in the who. So. I've not seen that much. I see, like, five episodes a year, because I see the Christmas, ep this Christmas episode, and then all of the Doctor Who that BBC decides to play after the Christmas episode. Yeah. Because every Christmas day, my parents and grandmother and everyone just sit down on the couch and turn on Doctor Who mm -hmm. after we open presents every year. So have you delved into any of the classic or not? Like, my favorite is Five, but that's because I went through a, a binge, and um, I I learned that Five was um, David Tennant, who was Ten's favorite, so I got intrigued. And so then I checked out Five, and I was like, you know what? I'm enjoying five. Not the effects are hilarious, but uh, <laughs> as you can well imagine, I've not delved into classic, but I want to, and I want to watch more. It's just hard to get the oomph, the oomph, the motivation. It is hard. Like that's one of the reasons I love my channel is like, cause sometimes it forces me to see things that I otherwise would not have sought out on my own. And you find some real gems that way, which is a lot of fun, which is again, what's so fun about the Rex is that it sends you to places that you might not have necessarily found yourself. Otherwise and you can find a really fun fandom that way. Oh yeah. That's one of my absolute favorite current series on a, like a big YouTube channel. Mm -hmm is Epic Reads, who is a publisher who publishes a lot of popular stuff. Mm -hmm. They have Mackenzie Lee, who is one of my favorite authors, who does a book recommendation series on their channel. Nice. It is wonderful, because she rec she's a bookseller and also an author, so she recommends stuff that I wouldn't have otherwise heard of because she sells books, because mm. she has to read books to sell books and also writes books, so she's friends with a bunch of people. It's really cool to get those recommendations. No, that sounds really cool. I'm going to check that out because I'm, despite the fact that I have no time, I'm always looking for new books to add to my list of things to read because I just, I love reading. That was one of the things I really missed um, after I had my um, daughter because it's, it's impossible to read with a newborn baby. So I'm looking forward to reading again. That's going to be fun. <laughs> audio books <laughs> yeah i did a lot of um i i shill it every time people bring that up um lavar burton reads is fantastic it's geordie from star trek reading you short fiction and it's great i i think i've heard you talk about that before. yeah no like i always recommend it because it's it's such a fun way to experience short fiction which is something that can be very hard to get into because lots of people don't really know what avenues to go down to find good short fiction so that's a really fun way to discover some short fiction authors i have this one i have to say it because if someone who is watching this knows what this story is i will be so thankful um i have this memory of a story that I read, and I've Googled it, and I've Wikipedia'd it, and I've fallen down the rabbit hole. I cannot find it. It is a retelling of Princess Donkey Skin. Okay. Which is basically this girl, her father wants to marry her because her mother died. She has, she gets, like, three or four dresses that are really fancy, and then her fairy godmother tells her to run away. You know, run away, run away, be a peasant, whatever. And I've read this retelling. Where instead of a fairy godmother, it's a warrior queen of an opposite land. Mm -hmm. And I could have sworn I read it. I'm starting to think that I dreamed it up. And if I did, I'm writing it. Um, but I could have sworn I read it. So if anyone's read this, tell me because I need the help. Yes, in the comments. Let us know. Is this the Mandela effect or did this happen? We need to know. <laughs> No, like, sometimes I do that, too, like, on my channel. Like, I'll just ask, because, like, that's happened to me more than once, where I just have vague memories, usually of movies, and then it does get that, that surreal feeling that it has to have been a dream, because why has nobody else heard about this? For me, Rainbow Wars was that for a long time until I found it again, and I was like, I knew Rainbow War was real. I knew I saw this when I was a child. <laughs> that sounds kind of wonderful. Was it, like, Rainbow Bright fighting people? Oh, my God. So it's it's a... 
it's a way to explain the primary colors to children in that there are three different kingdoms. There's the red kingdom, the blue kingdom, and the yellow kingdom. And they're each a different type of kingdom. Like the blue kingdom is like a renaissance, like French kingdom. The yellow one is the tech kingdom with like all the, the helicopters and airplanes, but like early tech, like the 1900s, like, or, like arising. And then the red kingdom was the medieval kingdom. And it's like how they're all kind of aware of each other, but they don't like each other. And it's about a yellow pilot who falls in love with the um, princess from the Red Kingdom and he flies his helicopter over there. And so they have a <laughs> rainbow war where they all go to war with each other and create all the other colors. <laughs> and it was amazing. It's like Romeo and Juliet, but more amazing and more convoluted. <laughs> and they all throw paint at each other, and it's great. I finally found it on um, Daily Motion, like this year. It apparently was a German children's special, so I'm like, yes. <laughs> I found... like, how did I find this? <laughs> I like it was one of those things where you type into Google like something really convoluted, just like a long stream of like a movie where this happened and this also happened. <laughs> And it popped up. I was so happy. No, that's the that's the best when you find something you've been looking for forever and that it's real. <laughs> so I hope somebody saw that in the comments when I post this. <laughs> Please tell me if there's a, a warrior queen story but Princess Donkey Skin. <laughs> I need to know. I, I've checked I checked the anthology that I thought it was in mm -hmm. and it was not in that anthology. So when you interact with like um, your friends out there in the non like online sphere, are most of them into the into fandom as well? Or so at this point in time, I only really have two friends that are not in the online sphere. Mm -hmm. um, let's just say twenty seventeen was horrible Aww. and painful, but um, almost all of them do. Mm. Uh, Maria, who is cinnamon roll. Who is like bookish sin and roll mm -hmm. does not um because she is a gymnast who spends five days a week in the gym mm -hmm. so she doesn't exactly have time to scroll through tumblr at midnight yeah like the rest of us but everyone else everyone else does and my online friends obviously do mm -hmm. i have i have one or two who are more like focused on like the social justice internet stuff mm -hmm. but most of them are Hardcore fangirls. I uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but there is an online service that will send you a letter from your book boyfriend. No, I haven't seen that. What's that? It's, I think it's called Bookified. Yeah, it's Bookified. Um, it's really cool. And I showed it to one of my online friends. Mm -hmm. And they have custom letters you can order from whoever, you know, whoever you want. They all, you know, they obviously have like the staples, like yeah, Darcy. Christian Grey, yeah, you know Harry Potter, all of this, and she decided to order a three-page letter from Draco Malfoy, <laughs> <laughs> and she got it and she read it aloud to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, it was, it was precious. Uh, I hope that he said that his father is going to hear about this because if not, I want to send the letter. Back. <laughs> I'm like eighty-five percent sure that he asked her to tutor him. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I that service is really fun. I sent one of my friends a birthday for her birthday. I ordered her the dirtiest letter they sold <laughs> from a character from uh, Sarah J. Mass book, A Court of Thorns and Roses, mm -hmm. from Reband, and she like died when she got it. No, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it's glorious. So I I would say that the people I interact with are nerds. Yeah. <laughs> No, me, like, me too, mostly, but I do also, like, I love having also those non-nerd friends, but who are super into, like, what they're into, which is also very fun, because it reminds you of, like, the outside world, like, I have um, a friend who's, like, super into, like, botany, and it's just always, like, I'm splicing these plants together, and it's like, yeah, you do that, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> My friend who is super excited about the quinceanera thing is a biology nerd mm. so she which is nice because she can tutor me on biology if i'm like panicking and it's midnight and i have homework due the next day mm -hmm. um which happens more often than it should um because my biology teacher isn't that great at explaining things oh. especially plant related things she's amazing 
but we have an hour a week. Mm. How did you come to be homeschooled, if you don't mind me asking? Um, so my parents were actually getting divorced the year I was going to start kindergarten. And my mom was like, yep, this is too much change. This is not happening. Mm. She's going to be homeschooled. And she actually tested me for the Discovery School, which is like a local, or like a, yeah, like a local, like, smart kids school. Like, private smart kids yeah. school. Yeah. And I, I, uh, they had, like, a written test you had to take. Keep in mind, this is kindergarten. Yeah. Written test you had to take, and it was, like, you know, math, like, math and stuff like that, and pictures and, you know, all mm-hmm. of that kindergarten stuff. Yeah. Um, so I stopped taking the test halfway through. I just, I was, like, I'm done with this. This is boring. Mm. And I tested in the top 95% of people who had tested. Mm. So my mom decided that that really wasn't a good school for me. <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we just homeschooled and we were like, okay, we're going to homeschool for a year or two. I'm still homeschooled. Mm-hmm. And it's high school. So that didn't work out how we wanted it. <laughs> Do you like it? It's wonderful. It, and it's it's really good, especially, you know, with the bookish stuff. We I get to help pick my books. Mm. Um, I went through some mental health stuff last year, and I had, you know, all of my ninth grade books were, like, The Color Purple, Animal Farm, all of these really depressing Intense, books. yeah. So my mom and I were like, nope, we're going to read Murder on the Orient Express in the entire Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. Mm-hmm. And it's also, you know, if there are days that we're feeling meh, we can, you know turn on crash course or something and just be like we got school done um like yesterday my mom and i were just like we're sick we're not gonna go to tutorial which is where i do my science classes um and where my mom teaches our history class and we got sushi and (laughs) we got sushi and then we played video games and planned my birthday party which is nice oh that's awesome (laughs) yeah it's we found a game called catopoly which is like monopoly except instead of properties you buy cats (laughs) That's awesome. <laughs> Different breeds of cats. Yeah. And of course, one of my one of my friends who is obsessed with cats is is uh, going to come and play it with us and Mhm. It's going to be it's going to be interesting. So, uh, it's nice to have some flexibility. Yeah. So, do you not ever wish for the public school experience or never? Never? <laughs> because it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain. Um when you're, and I think you probably, and a lot of people probably have this experience, when you're a nerd and, like, a specific type of person, mm-hmm. it's hard to find your people. Mm-hmm. I, for one, have been labeled, like, I'm too weird for the normal kids. Mm. You know, even the ones that are nerdy, I'm alternative and edgy and weird, and I talk about feminism and queer politics and what? Mm-hmm. She cares about the world she lives in. I'm shocked. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then for the people that are edgy and weird, I'm too normal because I like happy things and don't listen to emo music 24 hours. <laughs> so it's been hard. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, being homeschooled gives me a little bit more of a wider range of people simply because I get to pick my crowd because I just get to go on the internet and be like, these are my humans instead of having to actually make friends in real life, which is painful. No, like the internet, it, it has, it has its pros and cons, especially when used correctly for meeting people. It can be wonderful. I mean, there's always, of course, that danger element, but that just comes with, that can be navigated by being taught how to use it correctly and smartly and by keeping communication lines open, because that's always important to keep communication lines open with like your parents and people and just people around you in general, when you're communicating with people online, because there is like, meaning real life real they're both difficult in their own ways like they both they both have their own like difficulties and their own things to deal with like sometimes it's nice to have that distance that you can have online that you don't get in real life and the thing with the schooling system like because i i did um the public schooling system though but i broke um i moved like halfway through so i moved schools like halfway through from like in the middle of middle school i moved schools so i went from seven grade seven one school grade eight to another and it was the best experience of my life because it broke up the people because up until that point Mm. you've grown up with the same people the entire time and i was um i was bullied and I, i wasn't finding people or anything like that and so that break of all of a sudden these are new people and nobody knew me and it was like yes and it was wonderful and then i found like 
I didn't really find anybody who like stuck with me until like years later, but it was just nice to have that break and that realization that you could meet different people. Because when I was growing up, the internet was really just coming into its, its own as a way to communicate. Like for me yeah. growing up, MSN was still like, Oh my God, instant messenger. It's like, you would do that thing where like you would come home and the people lived a block from you, but you would talk to them on MSN. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> and nowadays, the people who live a block from you are horrible humans, and the people who live 100 miles away are who you talk to on the internet. Well, the internet just opens it up that you can meet so many different people, and that's the really fun thing about it, and they can be from anywhere. Oh, yeah. And that's what's I, really cool. It's definitely dangerous at times, but um, it's definitely a really good place, especially when you find people who like are who are good. Like Discord, one of the servers that I'm on, mm -hmm. um, the one that I love so much, they have so many admins and so many people who want to keep it safe. Like one of the main admins mm -hmm. who I'm really good friends with, she's like a mom, she's amazing, mm -hmm. is a youth pastor. So she's like all like 100% into keeping it safe for kids and teens mm -hmm. to have a place they can be themselves and be okay. Because in the South, everything sucks. Um, and a lot of kids can't be honest to their parents. So having an online space where that's okay is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky. I can be honest. My mom knows everything about me, and it's wonderful. But a lot of people have a really hard time with honesty, especially where parents are concerned around here. So it's nice to be able to have people, have a place where people from all over the world can join together and to be and can be supportive and can be friendly and it's wonderful. I think that's one of the great parts about the internet. It's also made some kids identify with other cultures more than their own, which is another fascinating concept. No, and it makes me happy to hear about people um, in the older generation really making that effort to create that safe space because, you know, like there are a lot of people who are older who still don't really understand how the internet works or how to navigate or how to make it a fun, safe place for people. And like, Safe doesn't have to mean, you know, stayed or chased or, you know, unchallenging, which I think is what a lot of people are afraid when they hear the word safe space. They think that people just hole up in a bubble and they never have to hear an alternate opinion again. And they just, you know, sit in a corner. And that's not what a safe space has to be. A safe space can just be a, a place free of harassment and, you know. Yeah. And a place where you can just say your opinion and it be okay. It doesn't have to be a place where everybody agrees with you. Oh, it's it's absolutely true. And this place, whoop, that I cannot throw my laptop across the room. That would be a bad thing. You know, this place is wonderful because they have like word like word slurs for every group of people are all banned. All slurs are banned. Like you immediately get kicked out if you use a slur. It won't be published. Nothing like that happens. Mm -hmm. And they have it. You know, they have it made so that there are places, you know, there are different servers, or not different servers, but different channels in the server for, you know, discussions about religion, discussions about queer stuff, discussions about politics, so that you can choose what you want to see and what you're uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. They keep it as safe as they can, and I think that's what more people need to understand about the internet. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, like, safe spaces aren't the places that you, like, nobody curses. Like, everybody under has an understanding of, you know, stuff and can curse or whatever, but you're being nice to each other and you're respecting each other. Mm -hmm. I feel like safe and respect, people don't understand, a lot of people don't understand how mm -hmm. congruous those two are. And how they're almost synonyms when you're talking about spaces. No, respect is very important, especially online. It tends not to be in play a lot. But I have a question about that because you mentioned all the different, you know, servers for different things. Do you ever worry that there is a danger that someone could completely shut their, themselves off from something? Because, because sometimes being challenged necessitates being uncomfortable. That's important, but the the focus more mm -hmm. i think relies on people being able to shut themselves out of things that could hurt them um like a lot of people have stuff in their past that they'd rather not have to deal with and i think including myself i think everyone has some of that mm -hmm. some stuff that you know i know that the word triggered isn't is used nowadays as, as it was something that's very yeah, that's something very negative, you know, oh, you're triggered. Yeah, it's more you're like a buzzword triggered. now. Yeah, yeah, it's a buzzword. 
but it's a real thing for people who've you know gone through really crappy experiences or have mental issues um disorders and such people who the internet is often a really good space safe space for i think that yeah you can get to a point where you're being too shutting yourself off from way too much and you're not learning anything but i think that that can happen just as much in real life as it can online i mean like i said i've literally had people tell me oh we can't be friends with you because you talk about feminism and we don't want to hear about that and you talk about politics and that's not okay these are these are kids who are almost 15 years old, deciding that they don't want to hear about stuff that's happening in their world. That's shutting yourself off from stuff, but uh, there are two different... That's an interesting point, but do you think that people have that choice, though, of shutting... Do you think people have that choice to shut themselves off that way, or do you feel that that's not a full engagement with one's environment? Both. Mm. Um, I think that if it's something that gives like is painful like will make you really uncomfortable if it's something that will hurt you in the long run like if you've had something bad happen and people mention stuff like that around you um and obviously at some point you get used to it um but it takes time and even then if someone like if someone made a joke about sexual assault that wouldn't be okay you know but there's a difference between deciding to shut yourself off from something because it makes you a little little uncomfortable and it's a little awkward and and shutting yourself off from something because it could possibly hurt you like that like mentally do you feel that that's a decision that people need to make for themselves or a decision that needs to be made societally I mean, obviously, everyone has their freedom to choose what they want to do. Um, and, I, you know, you can't say, you can't get into a big brother situation where you're like, you have to talk about everything. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah, but I think you get into the, you get, you know, you can also get into that kind of situation when you shut yourself off from everything. So it's, it's very, again, it's like that fine line. There's always a line. No, I think it was interesting what you um what you hit what you um hinted at with um like jokes. So what is your relationship like just personally, like not like for everybody, what is your relationship with um with humor? Like how how do you feel about humor? Because you know like humor is a very divisive thing for a lot of people. So how do you feel about it? Um, there's a really good video I reference videos a lot. Yeah. That's how I you know, that's how I interact with the internet. I think that's how a lot of us interact with the internet in a way. Um, but there's this amazing video by Sabrina, Nerdy and Gorky, who talks about the difference between comedies. Um, you can talk about things that are controversial, but the key is to always talk about the thing or the statistic rather than the person. Mm. Like, if you make a joke about se victims of sexual assault, um, like, there's a Sil Sarah Silverman joke that... So that somewhere along the lines of, um, like, you expect sexual assault survivors to report, um, like, who hurt them. They barely report about, you know, they barely ever report about the sexual assault itself. I mean, it's not that PC. It's a little bit more mm -hmm. rough. But it's, I mean, that's talking about statistics. You know, you these people feel these people don't report because it's scary. Why would they go further? It's not you know saying, oh these people suck. You know da 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 da. It's not blaming the victims. It's blaming the situation and the statistics. So there's a fine line with that, and I think that humor is important. Being able to laugh is important. Laughter is medicine. Laughter yeah. is a cure. But there's also, you can't hurt people. Culture right now is, is so... It's fascinating. Culture <laughs> is very, very fascinating right now. Like, everything about it, it's just like, they, there is, they say it's a Chinese proverb slash curse, but it's not. But um, it's, um, may you live in interesting times. And I think that that's definitely what is happening right now. And I acknowledge that that's not actually a Chinese proverb. Somebody just said that and attributed it to it, but it's... Someone just decided to say that. Someone decided to say it and then give it a, like, a cool origin that it doesn't have. But, yeah. but I have to that's say, um, I actually have to go. But okay. thank you so much for chatting with me. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. It's been great. Yeah.
And um, you enjoy the rest of your day and um, you send me all your links and all that good stuff. <laughs> I will. Alrighty. Thanks for chatting. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you so much. If you stayed all the way to the end, if you did, you know the drill. You are not only a trooper, but I have a question for you. Do you enjoy shoujo? And if so, what is your favorite? Also, have you ever had an experience where someone assumed that you would or would not like something and they were completely wrong? Let me know all about that down below. And you know me, I love a good essay comment. So feel free to go on a very long ramble. I, as always, appreciate you taking some time out of your day to spend it discussing fandom with me. There are, as always, more videos coming soon. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. I will see you all again when I can. And until then, let's get to that outro. Bye-bye. This has been Shipper's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Special thanks to all of my patrons, names on the side, for helping to make these videos possible. There are, as always, more videos coming soon. So until then, stay tuned, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.